the two looks like no plane ever built. It can take off at only a thousand feet, then climb at a spectacular 45 degree angle. In the late 1950s, the U-2 was the airplane of choice for U.S. intelligence gathering. But on May 1st, 1960, all that changed. And as I recall, we were having a meeting of Eisenhower and his national security people when we got word that uh, the Soviets had announced that they had shot down this aircraft. Fortunately, engineers had been working on a backup plan. If the U-2 was vulnerable, then the answer had to be a new plane that would be radar invisible, reach the edge of space itself, and fly faster than any plane in history. In 1959, Lockheed's design facility, nicknamed the Skunk Works, had begun working on a successor to the U-2. U-2 designer Kelly Johnson worked on 11 versions before arriving at the A-12, codenamed Oxcart. The A-12 was hoped to surpass Mach 3, or three times the speed of sound. You know, the most important thing for reconnaissance uh, since sliced bread. The CIA had high hopes for Oxcart. Unfortunately, the agency, already embarrassed by the U-2 shootdown, saw things go from bad to worse. La invasión imperialista estadounidense a Cuba en la Bahía de los Cochinos en abril 17 ha sido rechazada. Castro es triunfante. The Bay of Pigs invasion was a humiliating failure. President Kennedy was furious. Richard Bissell, the NRO's first director and Bay of Pigs architect, was shown the door, and the future of Oxcart was in jeopardy. To the rescue came intelligence advisors Jim Killian, former president of MIT, and Edwin Land, CEO of Polaroid. Land and Killian went to Kennedy and said, look, whatever your feelings about the agency and the clandestine services, there's some very important things going on out there. The Mach 3 airplane, the Oxcart, was then just starting into development. Oxcart got a reprieve. In July 1962, the NRO created Program D, also known as Aircraft Projects, to oversee acquisition and development of surveillance airplanes like the U-2 and A-12. Albert Bud Whelan supervised Oxcart progress at Nevada's super-secret aircraft test facility, Area 51. Getting Oxcart flying was a big part of my job. It was a mess. It was a mess in more ways than one. Oxcart's joints and seals had to function while expanded at high temperatures, but when cool, fuel and oil leaked through the gaps. SAC, of course, hated the airplane because it leaked and got oil on their, on their nice clean uh, uh, aprons. <laughs> Another challenge was getting enough titanium for Oxcart's body. Titanium was a critical stealth material which could reduce radar reflectivity, but the best source for titanium was Russia. So the CIA arranged titanium purchases through front companies, meaning Russia contributed to the planes designed to spy on themselves. In 1962, Oxcart test flights began. Unfortunately, so did crashes. Well, the airplanes stalled out, so we were losing airplanes left, right, and center. Engineer Kelly Johnson was called in. I said, Kelly, I said, we've got to switch to an electronic spike control, servo mechanism. And Kelly said, well, he said, I don't like electronics. He said, I understand hydraulics. I don't like electronics. And he said, besides, we've got $30 million invested in this hydraulic servo mechanism. I said, that's very interesting. I said, but every time we crack up an airplane, it's $30 million. I said, either you change it to an electronic system, we're going to cancel the program, Kelly. After years of ironing out the technical difficulties, in 1965, the A-12 was ready. And it was fast. That November, Oxcart achieved a top speed of Mach 3.29, well over three times the speed of sound, literally faster than a speeding bullet. A 1966 test flight crisscrossed the United States, covering over 10,000 miles in just over six hours. At an average speed of 1,660 miles per hour, just turning around required at least 86 miles. The only thing Oxcart needed now was a mission. They uh, had this as peacetime military sitting around with nothing to do. Worse yet, President Johnson clearly preferred the Air Force's alternative to the Oxcart, the SR-71 Blackbird. 
Although it was slower and couldn't fly as high as Oxcart, it had better sensors and reconnaissance capabilities. But the CIA was sure that Oxcart was the better plane. The A-12, that was a great aircraft. Then, in January 1967, tragedy struck. A broken fuel gauge caused an A-12 to run out of fuel unnoticed during a training mission. At that point, he punched out. He was about 100 feet up and was killed when a chute didn't open. Walt Ray, one of my pilots. It may have been the last straw. A month later, the Oxcart program was officially discontinued, infuriating teams who had worked on the A-12 for nearly a decade. I said, Jesus, how are we going to get this flight test program going? We have our operational pilots getting ready to run missions. But Then, in May 1967, an unexpected reprieve. President Johnson, angry about lopsided air losses in Vietnam, ordered the Air Force's SR-71 to gather reconnaissance photos of enemy surface-to-air missile sites. But the SR-71 was not yet ready, and the A-12 was. So began Operation Black Shield. What we did have was an aircraft that was much less vulnerable to uh, anti-aircraft fire than U-2s or any other aircraft. The A-12 flew dozens of Vietnam missions, gathering critical surface-to-air missile positioning information without a single loss. Then... Pueblo was boarded and seized by the North Koreans at 1432 Korean local time. This place is the Pueblo and the North, North Korea's seizure of the USS Pueblo on January 23, 1968, was a potential act of war. This is a hermit kingdom and a very dangerous re regime. North Korea and Kim Il-sung believed that the United States' plans were to bring down his regime. So he did a very dangerous thing in taking down the Pueblo. The U.S. needed rapid information. And again, the A-12 was the right plane at the right time. Oxcart captured this image of the Pueblo in Wonsan Harbor and returned without a shot being fired. Photos showed that the Pueblo was too close to shore for military action, leaving the U.S. to resolve the incident diplomatically. Unfortunately, it was Oxcart's final mission, and the program was canceled once and for all in June of 1968. Ultimately, Oxcart fell victim not to its failures, but to the NRO's success with satellites. The A-12's original 1959 mission was to gain information about Russia and other denied territories while minimizing risk to human pilots. But by 1968, the NRO's Corona and Gambit satellites were easily accomplishing that mission with no risk to human life whatsoever. And for missions that needed quick turnaround, there was still the SR-71 Blackbird. Like the A-12, the SR-71 had started as a secret program, but hadn't stayed that way for long. President Johnson called the Secretary of the Air Force and said, hey, that uh, SR-71, could that do Mach 3 or something spectacular? President Johnson's July 1964 press conference revealed the SR-71 and impressed the public. But CIA Director John McCone was furious. I got a call from uh, McCone chewing me out for this gross breach of security. And then I said, well, if that troubles you, you're going to have to ask Press to explain your problem to President Johnson. <laughs> While Oxcart languished in the shadows, still classified, the SR-71 became publicly known as the fastest plane in the world. But people in the IC knew that Oxcart was the real champ having set the record for sustained speed and altitude that remained unbroken for over 40 years. And both planes left their mark on the history of intelligence gathering. And hundreds of uh, missiles were fired at Hux carts and SR-71s, but none ever came close enough to do even minor damage. 